Welcome to the Fredericton Chamber of Commerce Lunch and Learn webinar series. Uh, today's topic, Performance Excellence, the Secret of High-Performing Organizations, is brought to you with the support of our sponsor, University of Fredericton. My name is Krista Ross. I'm CEO at the Fredericton Chamber of Commerce, and our presenter today is Jennifer Kickert. Jennifer is an organizational organizational designer at Simplicity Designs, and she is committed, motivated, and driven to help organizations see opportunities for improvement that often go unnoticed. She spent the last 12 years uh, working in the healthcare industry, and she has great experience and knowledge industries where the actual process you're trying to improve is hard to see. In 2008, she became the regional lead of process improvement for Horizon Health. Um, she worked in partnership with the Office of Strategy Management of the Government of New Brunswick, supporting the Departments of Social Development, Justice, and Attorney General, and Health with the implementation of their management systems and process improvement programs. She holds a process mastery certification from Hammer & Co. program in Boston, and she's a Lean Six Sigma Master Black Belt. Uh, she's a great and motivating speaker, and I've heard Jen before. She is great to listen to, and she's really happy to join, have joined Simplicity Designs in 2014, doing the work she loves, and she's happy to be with us today. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jennifer Kickert. Thank you, Krista. I am absolutely thrilled to be here. This is new for me, uh, the webinar. I'm usually standing in front of a large group of people and I can, I can see their faces, so this is a little uh, different. Um, wanted to tell you that um, we, Simplicity Designs always says that excellence isn't a do domain reserved for a select few, and we know this because we've seen it time and time again. And what we're going to talk about today is how you can implement the principles, methods, and tools of, of performance excellence into your organization, um, regardless of whether it's a, a small business, a large business, not-for-profit, or, or government agency, uh, the principles and methods and tools always apply and they always work. So we're going to start off with this quote uh, by Nelson Mandela. Education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. And what we're seeing in Atlanta, Canada, is that we need to start living with a growth mindset and not a fixed mindset. We're here to learn and to learn a different way to see your organization so that you look at your organization, the work you do, and the value that you create for your clients in a different way that will allow you to improve, innovate, and grow your business. I am going to give you a little bit of information on Simplicity Designs and our background. Uh, we are a, a small company, a startup uh, four years ago, so probably not much of a startup anymore. Um, we had five partners who started the business because we believe in the prosperity of Atlantic Canada. We believe uh, in the ability of all of the businesses and organizations in Canada to be able to improve, innovate, and grow. Uh, the original five partners have a wealth of experience in continuous improvement, process improvement, and performance excellence and came together uh, after working for very large organizations um, uh, and, and wanted to help as many small and medium-sized businesses and organizations in the Atlantic region as possible uh, and to share their knowledge that they have. Our purpose at Simplicity Designs is to make the world a better place, one organization at a time, and that's starting right here in Atlantic Canada. Um, the content of this webinar on performance excellence actually comes from a master's level UMB course uh, within the TME program. Uh, and a number of years ago, uh, when UMB TME only had five students, our president, Merv Sims, got involved and, and he and Drindra Shakla got together and revamped the content for that. Um, and some of you may know that now they've got over 500 students at the UMB TME program, the Technology Management and Entrepreneurship, and that, that program is recognized as one of the most entrepreneurial in the country. Uh, so we're very proud of them and what they've done. What we know is that prosperity comes from good jobs, and good jobs come from solving problems. So our name, Simplicity Designs, is really all about simplicity stands for systems thinking and flow and really trying to bring the simplicity um, to your complexity of your business. So uh, people will often say to us, I've read all the, the content, I had read all those books that you mentioned, but I just never knew how to put it all together. And so that's what we are able to do is to, is to put that all together. Um, 
a lot of people think we're a graphic design company, actually, because our name is Simplicity Designs, and uh, and we're not. Uh, design actually stands for how something works, uh, not not how it looks. And so we help you design uh, and deploy a better way to lead and manage your organization. So that's just a little bit about us. So what we're going to talk about today is uh, productivity and improvement rate and why that's important, the principles of performance excellence, the difference between working in your business and working on your business, the methods of performance excellence, and how the formal management system works all together to help you improve and innovate and grow your business. So performance excellence, just like any other science, whether it's medicine, law, engineering, or anything else, has principles, methods, and tools. And so if you, if you learn those and you always make your decisions based on those things, then you'll learn how to decrease the costs of, of running your organization and increase the value for your, your customers and clients at the exact same time. So I have a question for all of you, and even though I'm, I'm not going to ask you to answer me, but uh, just think about it for a minute. Um, and most, most of the time when we ask a group of people, you know, are prices going up or down, the answer is very quickly up. Everyone immediately, you know, says, oh, the prices of everything are going up. But if I were to show you this next picture, I wonder if any of you would remember this. So this is a 1984 19-inch color TV. And you actually had to get up and walk across the room to change the channel on it. And I used to love watching the, our 1984 TV, and we'd, we'd watch uh, all the Thursday night shows. We only had three channels. In 1984, this television was about $500 which today would be the equivalent of about $1,300. So if I was to say how many 19-inch color TVs can you buy today for $1,300, you can't. You actually have to pay people to take them away for you. You can't give them away for free because nobody wants them. But what can you get today for $1,300 is a Samsung Smart TV, which actually the value of that has now gone down to about $800. So what's the difference? The difference is that we continue to add value to things so that we can keep the price up. But what really happens over time is the value of everything is going to zero. So everything that you produce today or every service that you deliver today, the value of that is worth less tomorrow. So some other examples. Um, a gigabyte of data in 1956 cost $10 million. You can get 15 gigabytes of data free on Google Drive today. Um, Many of you might, might be like me. I have a number of cell phones sitting in drawers at my house that are worth nothing anymore because they they always get upgraded and there's new value and we always want the next thing. Um, a lot of legal work uh, that, that, that legal firms used to do for a long time, you can now do yourself online. People do their own taxes online now and they don't have to pay as much as they used to have to pay to accountants to do that. Um, sure, I'm not the only person that had a $500 long distance phone bill in university. Uh, that I had to figure out how to pay, um, but you don't even have long distance phone bills anymore. So the first concept that we put in front of people is that you need to be improving and innovating and growing your business because if you're not improving at a certain rate every year, you're going in the other direction because the world is continuing to devalue everything, whether it's a product or a service. Um, and we've actually had, you know, pushback from people that said, well, you know, what about knowledge? Knowledge isn't, that, that never devalues. But in fact, if you think about even the most um, specialized um, uh, industries, medicine now, there, there's programs and technology that allow physicians to look up uh, hundreds of types of uh, drugs and interactions between them so that they can make a better diagnosis and decision. Um, with, in the law firm as well, they've got uh, software now that can search hundreds of thousands of precedent cases to make to allow the, the lawyers and judges come up with the, the best situation there and the best decisions. So technology uh, and improvement and innovation drive everything to zero. So we have to be able to stay ahead of that. And everyone always says, well, how do I create value, uh, additional value for my customers in a world where everything is being devalued? So this next slide shows, we often walk through this with organizations to say, you know, where are you on, on this? Are you a needs improvement type organization? Are you pretty good or are you great? Because those that are improving faster than the others uh, that are staying ahead of it, they are able to innovate because they, they can weather the ups and downs. And if you look at the squiggly line uh, on the screen that's going, going down, 
sometimes those are decades. And so people will say, well, you know, this price of this has gone up and the price of that has gone up. But these can be decades depending on what, what it is that we're talking about. So over time, everything does go down. If you're a needs improvement organization and you're the red line, you can't weather those ups and downs in the markets and in the industries. And so that's when people start cutting. And that's where services start getting canceled and that's where people start losing those jobs. And the interesting thing about this slide is two years ago in March, the Nokia CEO uh, stood uh, with his head in his hands and tears in front of his company and, and it was on the news and he actually said, uh, we didn't do anything wrong, we just didn't improve fast enough. And this quote has been on the slide for four years, so it's interesting to me because it's, it's almost exactly what he said. Um, so you can be moving in the right direction and, and doing the right things, but if you're not improving fast enough, then you can get run over by your competition and you won't stay ahead of it. Uh, what we know is that the world is moving at about 2%. So if you are not improving your products and services and your processes by at least 2% every year, um, then you're, you're losing that the next year because you have to be able to deliver next year for 2% less than you did this year. And so we work with organizations to figure out what their improvement rate needs to be. So I'll give you some examples of, of red, black, and green organizations. So you see here on your screen, Sears, Walmart, and Amazon. Sears is the red line. Uh, they, they're on their way out. Walmart, it would be the black line. And of course, Amazon is the green line. Amazon is constantly looking for ways to add value for their customers. And I don't know if anyone uh, has seen the, the latest Amazon Go stores that they've got it. They're piloting in the U.S. right now, but they're very interesting because you walk in to, it's a grocery store, and you walk in and you have a card and, uh, that the, they give you um, that's in your purse or, or in your bag, whatever, and you just go in and take all the food that you want and you walk out. And it charges the card. So they are always looking at ways of adding value. When they talked to their clients, what they found out was that they just didn't want to wait in line to pay for the food. So they're figuring out new ways to add value so that people can save time, because time is one of the biggest commodities right now that we, we don't have and we can't get back. Another really good example of uh, red, black, or green is BlackBerry, Apple, and Samsung. So obviously, you know, Apple and, and Samsung doing better, BlackBerry is no longer doing very well. And they, that's because they had what we call an inside out thinking. So they were very good at one thing, and that was security. And then the con competitors were listening and seeing what the customers and the clients wanted, and those were apps. And when they had the conversation, um, the folks at BlackBerry said, well, no, we're, we're good at security, and that's what we're going to do. And then nobody cared about security anymore. Everybody was all over Facebook posting pictures about going to Jamaica and letting everyone know that they weren't even in their house anymore. And uh, it just became uh, less of a, a commodity that the, the clients wanted. So BlackBerry ended up um, in trouble because they weren't listening to what the customer wanted. Uh, they were more inside out thinking about what they thought they were good at. And so one of the things that we always talk to uh, organizations about is you need to identify what your client values because they determine your value, you can't determine your value. So if we could just go back quickly to this, productivity is how we can improve, innovate, and grow. Um, and you have to grow your business or else your best people will leave. Whenever we talk to you know, organizations about you have to improve first and then you get to innovate and then you can grow your organization, uh, we see a lot of organizations that, or businesses that grow too quickly um, without improvement and then they get into a little bit of trouble. Um, but if you are not improving and innovating, then you are, you are not able to grow and your, your best people will leave if they don't see opportunity. Um, when you are improving, then you can weather those ups and downs. So, um, and you, what we also know is the, of the original 400 and, or the original fo Fortune 500 companies, there are, are only about 15 still in existence. The other 485 are, are no longer around. So they knew what their rate was to keep improving. Um, uh, Procter & Gamble is one of those. So we challenge you to, to have a conversation about, you know, where are we? Uh, do we need to improve? Are we, are we doing just good? Are we keeping up at the 2%? Or do we, do, do we need to do a little bit better um, And if we're going to improve faster than the competition? So that would be just a takeaway for you to think about. Productivity, why is it important? Where do we stand? How do we get better at it? 
there's been a lot of um, uh, discussion around productivity lately in the Atlantic provinces, and and we hear a lot that we're the low cost province, uh, New Brunswick, to do business and. And unfortunately, what we know is that we had better be because we don't create enough value uh, in our work here. Um, what we know is that between 1945 and 1981, from the end of the war until 1981, the world was all about production. Um, we won the war, uh, of course, and we blew up the other folks, and so demand was much higher in the world than supply at the time. And so if you think about what that formula would be for North America, the price of anything was the cost of what it was to, to make that product or deliver that surface, plus whatever profit you wanted, because they had to buy it, and everyone else was rebuilding. Today, that has switched dramatically. Um, ever since 1981 and, and, and onward, since you know even 1989, since the Berlin Wall came down, we now live in a global economy, uh, and the supply has outstripped demand. And so the formula changes. The formula is not any longer the price is whatever cost plus profit. Today, profit equals the price that people will pay for it minus the cost that it takes to do it. And so interesting fact about today is that only 3% of the working population in North America make the food that we all eat. 6% of the population actually make things like pens and computers and, and things that we use. That leaves 91% of the population working in knowledge and service industries. And between 1945 and 1981, if you wanted to make more money and be successful, you just had to produce more. But we don't need, it. it's moved now from production to productivity. And so productivity is much, is much more important today, and productivity is what drives your improvement rate. Um, if anyone has seen any of the recent articles about um, the GDP in New Brunswick, it's very, very low. Uh, the Conference Board of Canada, their last um, uh, study that came out, we got a D minus on a report card in terms of labor productivity. So the value produced per hour is nowhere near where it is in other countries, um, and, and we have a lot of work to do in that area. And sometimes I hear people say, I don't understand what you mean by that because I work very hard. And we do work very hard uh, here in the Atlantic provinces. We're just not producing enough value for our customers and for our clients. And I'll give you a quick example of that. Um, years ago, I worked at one of the hospitals, and there was a lot of complaints from the public about a particular outpatient clinic where people had to stay online uh, on the phone to make an appointment, and then when they showed up, they had to wait as well for an hour or two. So they asked me to go look at the process about, of what was going on there. And I met with the woman who was making all the appointments, and she had, you know, people on, on hold and was trying to schedule all these appointments for people and getting them all in there. And then I watched that for a bit. Then I went down to the clinic, and I watched everyone walk in be told to take a ticket and have a seat. And so I asked them, well, don't these people have appointments? And they said, well, yes, but we just make them all take a ticket when they come in anyway. So even though this woman spent her eight-hour day booking appointments for people to come to this outpatient clinic, the appointments were not being respected. And so there was absolutely no value in, in her actually booking the appointments at all. So we can work very hard and in the end not deliver the value to our customers that we should be. So we know that we, we don't really have a cost problem here. Uh, we do have a value problem. Um, and so what I'd like to introduce you to um, is the three productivity drivers. Three ways to improve productivity. There's invention, the creation of a new idea or method, um, or we like to call it just putting money into an idea, and we don't really need much more of that. Innovation is the development of new values, so that actually takes those ideas and creates new money out of it, which is good. But improvement is doing the same thing better, faster, using less resources. And we talk a lot about, um, we use the example, actually, of the end of, of the war in 1945. Um, because one of the best examples of productivity was the Boeing plant back then. Um, we won that war because we won the battle of resources, and we were able to produce the, the, the planes faster than the, the other guys could. And it was women and farmers who worked in those plants building those planes, and they actually took the costs of building those planes from $240,000 to $120,000, so they cut the cost in half, the quality improved, and they actually produced, um, they went from 60 planes a month to 360 planes a month. And this is women and farmers who were not skilled in, in doing this that were able to achieve those results. 
And one of the reasons they were able to achieve those results is because they had a aligned purpose as a group, uh, win the war, bring our husbands and our, and our children home safely. Um, and the one thing you never heard in the Boeing plant was, that's not my job, because they all work together as a team. And so what we work with organizations to understand is that jobs can kill improvement. You need teamwork to deliver value to clients. And when you start with the not, that's not my job concept, it starts to erode the ability to create that value for your clients. And an interesting story about that and how important that purpose is to an organization, uh, my grandmother was uh, one of those women working in the plant, and she's now 95 years old, and she lives in a home outside Moncton, and she does not have any recollection of uh, any of her children. She doesn't know any of her grandchildren. She does not remember her husband, but when you go in to speak to her, she'll speak to you for a couple minutes and then very politely get up and say, well, I have to go build the plane. No one else is going to build the plane. So after 95 years, um, that is the one thing that she, she still has recollection of, which just, you know, illustrates the importance of, of, of purpose. So this is what we call the productivity triangle. And so most organizations really work the improvement cost side of the triangle, and they're always focusing on reducing costs, eliminating costs, and doing things faster, better, using less resources as well. And what we teach is that you have to be working both sides of the triangle. You have to be looking at your customers and figuring out what would add more value to them. Because the optimum price of anything is halfway between the cost to deliver or produce that and the value that your clients feel is there. And so with the profit equals price minus cost formula today, we need to be working both sides of that triangle. And the people that do this probably the best, one of the examples that we use is um, a company that had you invested in uh, 1974, $10,000 in this business, you would now have $10 million. Um, and it's an interesting, it, usually when we do this with folks, they think of technology companies or McDonald's or any, any company that's done very well over the last number of decades. Um, you would never guess that this is actually an airline and it's uh, Southwest Airlines. Southwest Airlines is one of the most profitable airlines. They are the safest, and they have the absolute widest triangle. And they are able to do that because they have a very clear purpose. They did not go after all the other people and their competitors' um, clients that flew. They went and asked all the people who didn't fly why they didn't fly. And the answer they got from their customers was because it costs too much and it takes too long. So Southwest Airlines, their vision and their passion is connecting family and friends faster and cheaper than buses and trains. And so when you have that clarity of purpose in your organization, it becomes much easier to make decisions because they don't argue about whether to put chicken in the salad because they don't have salad. Because salad is not going to help anyone connect family and friends faster and cheaper than buses and trains. So when you've got that clarity of purpose and you know exactly what it is you're trying to do, then you have that ability to do that. They've got a 33% productivity gain on the industry. They grow at about, about four airports per year. And what they do know is the one key process metric that they have to watch every single day to make sure that they're able to stay the, the, the cheapest airline and get people um, where they want to go faster, and it's actually the turnaround time on the ground. They turn a plane around in 23 minutes. Other airlines do it in about an hour. And so you can't, uh, they won't fly in and out of LaGuardia because they can't turn the plane around in 23 minutes, and they have to keep it at 23 minutes to be as efficient as they are. And so if they are running late and they're at risk of not actually turning the plane around in 23 minutes, who do you think gets up and helps clean the plane? It's the pilot because they all work together and they know what their purpose is and they know what the one metric is that they have to hit. So they, they work together very much as a team um, and they have a lot of fun doing it. In fact, it's harder to get, it's harder to get a, a job at Southwest than it is to get into Harvard. They, they get about 30,000 resumes a year of people wanting to work there. So it's very, it's very interesting story that way. So this is the innovation, improvement, invention, triangle. And so what organizations see and they look at usually is price minus cost. But what the client and customer sees is value minus price. You will never ever hear anyone say, oh my gosh, I got the best value, but it costs too much. People don't say that. If they feel they got value, they are, worth, they are willing to pay for it. And so we really work with organizations to ensure they're working both sides of, of that triangle. So we ask you, do you know your improvement rate? 
and you know it, the world is is moving at two percent. Um, we can't just to remain status quo. You have to be improving your organization by two percent a year. The organizations who do very well are about three to five percent. So if you're a hundred million dollar company, you need to be finding three to five million dollars every single year in improvements. If you're a hundred thousand dollar company, you need to be improving at three to five thousand dollars a year. If you're a ten million dollar company. Three hundred to six hundred thousand dollars a year. You need to be finding an improvement. So we'll work with organizations ba based on their their revenue or their budgets or whatever they have to say where are you now, and looking at where the world's going and and how much they want to improve. Figure out what that rate is so that they can figure out how many projects that they need to be doing to to get better. If anyone has not um, read any of the books by Jim Collins, we suggest that you do. He he speaks often about improvement rate. Um, and a lot of what we, the information that we have comes from um, uh, Good to Great, Great by Choice, and he also did a, a smaller one, Good to Great for the social sector, with, with so, social sector, which is really good too because it includes a lot of metrics uh, for the social sector that people struggle with coming up with. So uh, those are some, some good books that we recommend. So I'm going to jump in uh, to the principles of performance excellence. Um, Actually, recently I was reading a Harvard Business Review article, and they actually were saying that to be successful in the next decade, um, uh, you need your technical skills in whatever industry you are in, whether it be medicine, law, or engineering, or social sector, any of those things. But if you don't understand process, and you don't understand flow of work, and you don't understand how to lead change, you're not going to be able to compete. And so it's a whole other um, area of work that, that I love working in because it, it's very challenging and, it, and it's exciting when people start seeing that they work that they do, um, how they can improve it and where there's so much time wasted there. So every organization, no matter what size or what industry, is made up of three parts. Uh, they have a purpose for why they exist. They have processes that deliver value or products to a customer or client, and they have people that execute those processes. Purpose is what motivates. Um, pain also motivates, but pain goes away over time. And so you need a purpose that aligns everyone in the organization. And this is probably one of the things that I think we do be better than anybody else is we really get the purpose, process, and people of an organization aligned together. Um, and I'll give you a couple of examples. I mean, the example of my grandmother and, and the purpose, that's always a great example. Um, but I, also a, a housekeeping staff member in one of our hospitals in our province was asked, um, you know, what do you do? And they said, well, I'm, I'm housekeeping. I clean toilets. When one of the housekeeping staff uh, at the Kingston General in Ontario was asked, what do you do? Their answer was, "We save li I save lives. And they said, well, what do you mean? You're in housekeeping. And he said, yes. But the number one killer in the hospital is infection rate, and my job is to prevent infection rate. And so when you have that kind of aligned purpose, I think you do a much better job. Um, people are motivated by purpose. Uh, processes do not motivate people. It's the work that we have to do every day. It's kind of like driving to work and forgetting that you actually drove there because you do it so often you don't remember doing it. Um, processes are not nearly as motivating as processes, but as purpose. And so we need a purpose because there's nothing worse than just doing a job. Um, and that's when you start hearing, and we, we often say jobs kill improvement. And so it's just one, one thing to keep in mind that do you know and are you really clear on the purpose of your organization? Because not, not many are crystal clear. And if we were to say, you know, what is your organization's most valuable asset? The answer is almost every single time, uh, people. So this is Dave Ulrich. Um, he's one of the most world-renowned HR gurus. Um, in the 80s, he was $20,000 a day to come and speak. He's now $100,000 a day to come and speak if you can fly him in and out on the same day. Um, he, he works with the Ross School of Business, and he, writ he wrote the book HR from the Outside In. And we talk a lot about outside-in thinking from the customer back. And so what he always tells people when they say, well, our people are our most important asset, he tells them, no, your people are your most important decision of who you're going to put on the bus and who you're going to have work with you, but your most important asset is your customer. Because without your customer, you don't need your business and you don't need your people. And it doesn't matter if you're in service or knowledge industry or manufacturing or, or government. Um, and I, you know, I was working with government folks uh, this week and they struggle with who their customer is um, because 
you know, it, it gets a little bit complicated. So who is your customer and what do they value? Because only they can determine what, what your value is worth. So if you're a for-profit business, you know, the only person who brings cash uh, to your business is why you exist. Um, BlackBerry, for example, felt heavily that their people were their number one asset and they made their decisions inside out, not outside in from the customer. And so then eventually a lot of their great people ended up losing their jobs. And what we know today is customer loyalty is just simply lack of a better alternative. And so you really got to understand your customers and what they really want and what they're really looking for. So um, we talk about the hedgehog concept. That's Jim Collins as well. You know, do you know your vision and your passion? Um, do you prioritize what you do by your customer or do you do it by your passion in your vision? And do you know your uh, financial situation, your improvement rate? Um, and you kind of need to have all three because um, if, you, if you have a vision and you have a financial model but you don't have a customer, then that's just a hobby that you have. If you have a vision and you, and you have a, a customer that's interested but you have no financial model, um, that's a pipe dream. So, you know, and if you have a financial model and you have a customer but you have no passion about it, you might be rich but you're going to end up bored. Uh, and you have to make sure that you prioritize what you do but from your customer's perspective back, not by what you love the most. So, number one asset, number one pr pr principle of performance excellence is always your customer is your number one asset. Are you making every decision from their perspective? So, Amazon, for example, in their boardroom, they have an empty chair with a label on it that says customer. And every time two people get in an argument about what they think should happen, because if, you know we're all paid for opinions in service and knowledge industries, um, someone has to go sit in the chair and act as the customer. And so it's not really what I think, and it's not really what you think. What the customer thinks is really most important. So understanding that, and people will say often, well, how do I know? How do I know what my customer values? Um, and do I just ask them? And there's three ways that you can identify what is of value to your customer. Uh, the first is what they expect. The second is what they express they would like. And the third is what might excite them. Uh, it's called the Kano number for anyone who's ever seen it. And so what they expect is what they're complaining about because they're not getting it. So if I went and bought a new car and it did not have four new tires on it, I would complain about that because I expect uh, that I would get that. Um, it's worse if they don't complain because they just go somewhere else. Um, Express is really what they're asking for, what they say they would like. So if I go and buy that same new car, I might expect that there'd be four winter tires on it, but I might ask to have another set of tires thrown in. So that might be something that I would ask for that, that would be of value to me as a customer. And Excite is a little more tricky because it's really around how can you solve a problem for your client that they didn't even know they had or they didn't think you could solve for them. And so we have a couple examples of this. In fact, um, Simplicity, um, our small company, you know, we want to work with as many organizations as we can to help them improve and grow. And a lot of people would say to us, you know what, um, I really want to work with you, but I can't afford you. And so we had to be able to get really good at figuring out what funding was available from, from what organizations in the province to help them. Um, we've even, you know, gone so far as to offer to take equity in their organization um, or share the gains. So we'll work with them for improvement uh, on an agreement that, that we'll get paid after the fact. So we're both invested in that. So that really excites them and, and it solves a problem for them at the same time. Probably the best organization in the world at Excite would be Disney. They are very good at exciting their clients and for anyone who's ever been there, you know it's not a cheap trip. Um, I have been there a few times and I in fact was there last week with my kids and they are always adding value for their clients and they are always adding things to excite you. Um, if you go into the park and it starts to rain and you think, oh crap, it's raining, umbrellas just appear everywhere uh, at the side of the buildings and they magically appear so you can use them. Um, they also have strollers at about 45 minutes in, into every part. They have them at the front door, but there's a lot of toddlers that don't want to get in as soon as they arrive because they're too excited. But about 45 minutes in, in any direction, in any of those parks, the toddler's done and they, they want a stroller. So Disney has all their, their strollers um, lined up at the 45 minutes in as well so that they're just there for you to purchase. And there's a huge value. You would pay a lot for the stroller at that point. 
for those people. Um, what I found out last week when I was there that they've added, which is very new, is you can download an app on your phone now, the Disney app. And so you don't have to walk 20 minutes across to the other side of the park to see, uh, to find out that there's a ride with a wait list of an hour and a half. So they have every single ride and attraction on this app and the wait times that are currently there. So you can just look at your app and see where you want to go, where the shortest wait lines are. That's constantly evaluating what would be of value to my customer. Um, and they're really, really good at doing that. So final example, when thinking about, you know, what your customers value, you can ask them. Um, you know, if Henry Ford would have asked his clients what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. Um, but he didn't. He, he, uh, he asked them, what problem do you have? And they said, the damn horse. It dies. I have to feed it. It's tired. It gets old. I have to get a new one. Um, and so he solved that problem for his clients. The minivan is an interesting one because back in the day, if you, any of you remember, minivans only had three doors. And the majority of people driving the minivans were moms. Um, and Ford actually asked the moms, do you want a fourth door in the minivan? And they said no. Um, Chrysler went out and watched mothers. And what they watched was that they often would have to crawl, you know, around that, that one seat where the door was to put the baby in the other side. And, and if they were pregnant, it was really difficult to do that and all that sort of stuff. And they just put a fourth door on the minivan and they completely stole the minivan market for many, many years. And uh, Ford stopped making minivans altogether for a long time. And now they're starting to c come back into that market. So it's really understanding what is of value to your client. When you know those three, those three things, when you know what people expect and you know what they're expressing, that is what you need to improve for your organization. When you know what they're asking for and you might be able to solve a problem for them, that is what should be your innovation list. And when you have those two things working, then you're able to grow your business. So this would be a takeaway exercise for you that I recommend uh, everybody do. What do your customers expect? What are they asking for? And what problem could you solve for them that they, they didn't even know they had or didn't think you could solve for them? These are the three E's again. There's just some more examples. And second question. When all the blame goes wrong, when everything goes wrong, where does all the blame go? Whenever we ask a group of people this, usually they just look at the other person sitting next to them or, you know, and we often say, well, if something goes wrong at that department down the hall or is that stupid person's fault or whatever have you. And what we know is that 85 to 96% of all problems, challenges, and opportunities in any organization are process problems. They are not people problems. 85% is manufacturing, 96% in service and knowledge because the process is very difficult to see. It's often uh, in your head or it's between people or it's on computers or it's very, if you're thinking of a manufacturing company, very easy to see where the process broke down and where the problem happened. In most of our organizations, you can't see the process right in front of you. All we see is the other people in the process. And so what we teach organizations is blame the process, not the people, and work with those people as, as a team to figure out where the process broke down. Um, this is especially true in knowledge industries because there's three types of work that we do on any given day. There's value-added work, which is something your client would actually pay you to do. There's value-enabling work, which is stuff you have to do to run your organization, but your client doesn't care about that. And there's non-value-added work, which is just pure waste. Um, usually the non-value added uh, waste is about 50% of any organization. Value added work is only about 20%. Value enabling is about 30%. And so we know that if you're not mapping and measuring and managing the processes of how you deliver value to your customers, 25 to 50% of what you're doing is waste and you're spending a lot of time chasing, checking and correcting. Um, that's what we, we call the CCC, chasing, checking and correcting. Um, and I worked with a fellow a long time ago who worked at Maple Leaf, and, and uh, when he came to work at Horizon, um, he said to me, wow, this is not like making bacon. And I said, no, it's not, because it's all, not, it's all people. All you see is the people. And so it's really important for people to understand that the work that they do is in a process um, and to figure out where that process is breaking down. Uh, these are the high-level tiers of any organization, the tier one processes, we call them. Even if you're a government, not for profit, they usually all exist. Um, you've got a brand, 
you've got innovation processes, market and sell processes, produce and deliver processes, and customer service. Um, that's called the value chain of what customers are willing to pay for. Uh, you, your enabler line, you've got your people, information technology, infrastructure, and value management. Um, and then the formal management system is your leadership processes, really, around making choice, uh, executing, and leading change with your people. And so we work with organizations to figure out where is your constraint. Which one of these is your biggest constraint? Because we have to work on that one first. So these are the first two key principles. Customer is your number one asset, and blame process, not people. Third question, have you ever rented an apartment? Most people have, especially if in university. And did you pay for new carpeting or new doors or upgrading appliances in that apartment? And of course, the answer is always no. And so we say, well, why not? And people say, because I didn't own it. And so there is a huge difference between renters and owners in any organization. Rent, the more renters you have in your business, the more chasing, checking, and correcting you require. Uh, more management, more of all of that stuff. They're watching the clock, clocking in, clocking out, eight to four, um, not really aligned with the, with the purpose, don't have the passion. Um, so, you know, if you think back to the housekeeping example uh, of the fella who feels that he goes to work every day to save lives, he's an owner. He owns that process. He's not just doing a job. Um, you know, and you want to hire owners in your organization, we, we have a mantra that says, you know, hire the soul and train for the role. So we hire character first in, in our organization, and then we look for competency after that, because you can, you can train competency, um, but character is most important. And when you have owners working for you, life becomes much easier because they handle things and they make decisions for the client. So they make their decisions outside in, as the CEO or the, or the executive folks might do. Um, one of the organizations we work with is Glenwood Kitchen out of uh, Shediac, and James McKenna speaks for us on a regular basis. And he was asked the question at a conference uh, one time, how, do you know that, how did you know that this performance excellence stuff was going to work, uh, that it wasn't just the flavor of the month and that it was going to stick this time? And James laughed and he said, I remember it exactly. It was 10 a.m. on a Tuesday morning, and I was sitting in my office, and I had nothing to do. And my phone wasn't ringing, and everything that was happening, they, the frontline guys handled everything. They made all the decisions in the best interest of the customer. They were doing improvements, and they just owned it. They were owning that work. And so the third principle of performance excellence is that people need to be owners. But we also need to create the environment for ownership. Um, and often, you know, people feel they, they've given improvement ideas before, and they were told, just do your job. Um, and so we need to create an environment where people can contribute. Um, you know, Dan Pink, if you ever have the chance to watch his video online called Drive or read the book, he speaks about the three things that most motivate people, and that is purpose, autonomy, and mastery. It's important people to have a say and to get better at what they're doing and to be aligned with the purpose. So those are the, the three key principles, um, which is the basis of, of everything we, we teach organizations when we work with them. And this is how it all lines up together. So if, you're, if you have that alignment of purpose, process, and people, and you can start looking at the work you're doing and differentiating in and on, which we're going to talk about here in a minute, you can have a 3 to 5% improvement, 3 to, three to 5 times a higher level of improvement than your competition. You can improve anywhere up to 10% per year. And we actually had a CEO recently that said, I didn't realize that I had to be focused and disciplined um, as the key to drive improvement and innovation. And, and discipline and focus are incredibly important. People often think that process improvement or process means bureaucracy, uh, and it's actually the opposite. If you have really streamlined, efficient processes, you don't need all the bureaucracy that goes along with that. So this is what we call the Duran Trilogy. Um, the, the father of everything we teach uh, is, Dr., is Dr. Deming. He's probably the one man more responsible for our standard of living than, than any other man. Um, he is, is the, the one who taught the folks in the Boeing plant how to improve on a daily basis. And at the end of every single day, he asked those women and farmers in the plant, what prevented you from having a perfect day? And whatever it was, they implemented that improvement the next day. They didn't plan a meeting a month from now because they didn't have the time. And so we put a lot of things off today that, that we could probably improve right away, but we schedule meetings for six weeks later, and we'll talk about that at the next meeting. Um, they didn't have time for that, and so we actually teach some of those processes with organizations so they understand 
I need to be looking at continuous improvement on a constant basis. So Duran took uh, Deming's work and he created the Duran Trilogy, which is quality planning, quality improvement, and quality control. We built on that um, with the formal management system. And I'm just going to go back here one second. So quality planning is all around making choice, strategic choices. Quality improvement is working on your business to improve it. And of course, quality control is working in your business to identify where your biggest constraints are. Leadership's percent of time. Organizations often spend 100% of their time chasing, checking, and correcting. Really good organizations can spend 60% of their time doing that, 40% making choice, and, and ad hoc, they, they work on their business to try to improve it. The great organizations that do this very well um, spend 60% of their time working on their business. And so a lot of companies that we work with um, say, I don't have time. I don't know where I'm going to find the time. And the one thing that I can guarantee you is that every one of you is working on too much. You've got multiple priorities, which isn't even a thing. Uh, priorities wasn't even a word before the turn of the century. It was priority. It meant one. Um, and we've, we've kind of created a whole new word with that. Um, and the cell phones has created a very interesting dynamic in the last decade. So um, everyone is on their phone all day long, and they get the little dopamine rush every time the little dinger goes off that I got an email or I got a text, and I'm very important, and let me check the phone, check the phone. If you can, you can actually probably likely spend the entire day just responding to emails and texts and do nothing else, and that is not really a value. Or you can have blocked time in your calendar to work on improving your business and check those emails and do it in 20 minutes at lunchtime. So I challenge you to try that um, because a lot of people are, are, are stuck on their phone and it has become an expectation that I answer everything right now. And it's not necessary to do that. So we spend a lot of time in inefficient meetings. We spend a lot of time um, emailing and texting, which actually is not communication. It's simply information sharing, and it often requires multiple back and forth, which is non-value-added work. And so when we work with organizations, we identify all these things, and we eliminate it, and we reduce it. So all of a sudden, they do find time to work on improving their business. So performance excellence principles, again, customer is your number one asset. Make all your decisions outside in from what they value. All of your problems, challenges, and opportunities are likely process problems, and we want ownership. Um, and we've got here on the slide ownership 4168. So what that means is there's typically 40 hours in a work week, um, although many of us laugh at that and, and because we're working at night and we're working on weekends and we're still on the phone checking the text and checking the email, but there is 168 hours in a week. And what we have found is that people who are owners that, that create, get that ownership and engagement and align with the purpose of an organization, um, they want to improve it. And so they will put more time in uh, without asking for overtime and those types of things. We've seen teams come in um, on weekends time and time again to work on improving the business once they, they get a taste of what the improvement can do for their clients and how much easier it makes their lives as well. Um, so the methods that we employ making choice, so we have a whole stri strategic choice process is that we work with organizations. Uh, we don't really believe in strategic plans because they just sit on, on shelves and collect dust and no one remembers what's in them. So what we do is we work with organizations to figure out a 90-day strategic process so that they are always focusing on the most important constraint and improving that one thing as well as meeting their, their customers' needs. Um, execution and process thinking is really around working in your business and working on your business and I, identifying how much time you, you need to spend doing that. And leading change. Uh, leading change is very different than change management. Change management is how you manage that change once the decision is final. Leading change is leading people to understand what needs to happen on their own. Um, and uh, we use Cotter's, um, our iceberg is melting, all it's a great book, it's probably the best business book on leading change out there, um, and it works wonders if you actually go through the, the eight steps that, that he has in the book and use those tools to get people to understand change. Um, and I'm going to ask you a question. That I've never, don't think we've ever done this on a webinar before, but I'm going to try it anyway. And you can just keep the answer in your mind, um, but as soon as I ask the question, um, I'm just interested to see what some of your answers would be. But if I was to say to you, what color is the yield sign? I think 
well, I'll, I'll tell you this. Yesterday I asked that question to 30 people, but I told them up front I wanted them to answer me the second I asked the question, and the entire room said yellow. And a yield sign is, red with, is white with red trim. So why did you think yellow in your mind? And you thought yellow in your mind because that's the right side of your brain, and your right side of the brain is how you see the world, and it's all the creative side. And so when I said yield, you thought caution, you saw yellow. So there's very different thinking that goes on between the right side of your brain and the left side of your brain. And when you're working in your business every day, that is right side brain thinking. It's have the answer, have the answer. It's why you slam on the brakes when the car in front of you does. It's an immediate reaction to how you see the world. Working in your business, you need to be having all the solutions all the time. You need to do that for you've got a thousand balls in the air, emails, deadlines, priorities, and you're, and you're making those decisions. Working on your business is left brain activity, and it requires you to slow down dramatically and use the rational, logical side of your brain to really clearly understand the problem and fix the one thing that is the most important that you need to improve on today. And so if you look, this is our formal management system in its entirety. So it goes right back to the beginning of aligning the three main parts of an organization, the purpose, the process, and the people. Um, your purpose motivates and aligns. Your process is how you deliver value to your client, and then you've got your people involved in that. To the right, you've got working in your business, and that is continuous improvement, daily management, every single day asking what prevented us from having a perfect day and trying to improve what you can the next morning. That is right brain activity. When you work on project management on the left-hand side, that's working on one project, one process at a time to improve the business, and it needs to be on your biggest constraint. So if you can, um, if you and, and leading change with the people, of course, it goes all the way around that as well. It's kind of like a circle that goes around the entire thing. So if you are able to do all of these things, putting them all together, um, if you can lead change correctly with people and not simply tell them this is what we're doing, if you can focus, have the focus of, of your passion like Southwest does, and if you can have discipline around your calendar, scheduling your in-work and your on-work, you have an 80% chance of success of improving and innovating and growing your organization. And so that is pretty much it for me. I did want to mention um, that this is the last slide that I, I, I as a takeaway for you, uh, to ask yourself in your organization, is your business achieving its required improvement rate or your organization if it's not a, a for-profit business? Are you working on your biggest constraint and only one, not multiple priorities because they'll never get done? And are you engaging the right people? Do you hire for character? Um, do you hire the soul and train for the role? Do you have the right people on the bus? And how do you engage them in aligning with your purpose and the organization's purpose to to uh, have make more value for your customers. And so now I will Hello everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. That was an amazing presentation from Jen. Um, we really appreciate this uh, insight that she shared with us. And um, we're going to be posting this webinar on our website. It'll be a couple of days before it arrives there. But um, please watch for it and feel free to share it with your colleagues because there was so much information there for us to, uh, to think about how we're managing our priority. Uh, how we're making sure we have the right people on the bus, and, and just the ways in which we can um, make our businesses uh, more efficient. Um, just want to also let you know, um, we've had some great experiences with Jen and the team at Simplicity here at the Chamber. Um, they've helped us with our strategic plan, and, and they did a, a great um, performance excellence program for a number of Chamber members. Uh, I guess that was last year, but I want to tell you that um, if this is something that interests you and you think that uh, Simplicity could help your organization, um, they do have a five-day workshop coming up here in Fredericton, uh, and it, I be, it begins on June the 9th. So if you're interested in more information on that, um, reach out to Simplicity or uh, reach out to the Chamber, and we can put you in touch with Jennifer. So again, thanks so much for joining us today, and thank you, Jennifer. Um, to show you our appreciation for your time and expertise, we're going to make a donation in your name to the Fredericton Chamber Scholarship Fund. Um, also, as always, we'd like to thank and acknowledge the 
University of Fredericton for sponsoring our Lunch and Learn webinar series. And again, take all this information that you've heard today and go back and think about how you can implement it into your business. Thanks and have a great day, everyone.